Did you ever see the old Ghostbusters movie from the 1980s? The scientists had one rule when trying to contain and capture the apparitions. Don't cross the streams. Meaning when the three of them fired their ghost capturing energy streams at the comic looking ghost to put it in a trap, they could not cross their streams because they did not know what the consequence would be of all that energy and momentum occurring at the same time. Perhaps this is similar to what we're going to talk about today. With the stream of political change taking place in France in the form of the French Revolution, today we're going to explore economic change as the Industrial Revolution unfolded in Great Britain before spreading to the continent and the United States. But how will all of these political and economic streams of energy and change affect the people themselves? What kind of social change will result if we cross the streams, if political and economic revolutions come together? Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Lancy. I teach at Coral Gable Senior High in Miami, Florida. Hi, everybody. My name is Todd Beach. I teach at Eastview High School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. That's a suburb of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And welcome to AP Live Review. All right, as we have the, the last session last week, we wanna start with kind of talking about our purpose. And our purpose is to supplement the learning that you've done all year in your AP European history class. We're gonna explore essential con content from this unit today. And we've been providing assignments. I hope that you've been tuning in and kind of checking your own work against what we've been doing because we really want you to practice for the AP exam. Um, we're encouraging you to engage in the homework. We want you to understand exactly what you need to do to be successful. And we're going to always go over the last session's homework so that you can see a model answer and then kind of compare what you did on your own to what we're showing you as a, as a good example. Uh, we want you to feel as prepared as possible. And we also want to remind you that you're not alone. I know the exam is right around the corner and there are students all over the country and at international schools all around the world. And so we're all in this together. We want you to feel that sense of community. All right, Todd, tell us about our, our week that we're starting here. Sure, thanks, Katie. So here we are for week two. This is session five. So you can see our content. We're gonna, we have a lot of content today, industrial revolution and the ideology, ideologies of change. You might remember those chapters on the isms. That's kind of what that is. Our skill development, we're gonna talk about different strategies to approach the multiple choice questions today, the MCQ, and your homework would be to work on an MCQ set. Session six, oh my gosh, the rest of this week is really, really important. So tomorrow, our session six, I should say, we're gonna do sourcing, kind of the micro skill of that larger thing that you do in the DBQ. Then session seven, you've gotta tune in because we are gonna structure a DBQ response for you We'll, we'll go through the structure underneath the document camera. We'll give you a DBQ to work on for homework. And in session eight, we'll finish with our content review. And we're also going to give you strategies and reminders about your upcoming exam. So a lot so, uh, going on this week. We hope you join in with us. Awesome. All right. So we have a lot to review today. There's a lot going on. But first, we want to spend some time uh, showing you the homework that you did over the weekend and reminding you that you had for homework a full LEQ to write. Uh, let's quickly have a look at the rubric that you can see on the screen. Uh, there are These are the first three sort of bands of points. We start off with one point for thesis or claim. You want to make sure that you're responding to the prompt, making a historically defensible claim. And very important, it has to include a line of reasoning. We see so many students that leave off that line of reasoning and miss out on the thesis point. Um, Todd and I really like you to start your essays in AP Euro with a nice contextualization. You're gonna give a broader historical context relevant to the prompt. It has to be more than just a phrase or a reference. So we'd really like that developed at the beginning. And we're gonna show you an example of someone who did that on one of the prompts you could have done for homework. And then under the evidence points, uh, there's that low bar point, right? For examples of evidence that are relevant to the topic of the prompt, but we really want you to go for two points and get uh, supporting an argument with relevant examples, plural, of evidence. So this, this will get you one, two, three, four out of six points. And Todd's gonna go over the last two points you can get on the LEQ. So the D category for the LEQ is analysis and reasoning. The one point category is, do you structure your argument in such a way that addresses the, the framework of the prompt? 
So if, it, if the argument is evaluate the most significant, for example, is your prompt, and it's talking about cause effect, we need to have a structure that's addressing cause effect. Okay, the two point category for to earn two points, we have good structure, but we also have complexity. And there are lots of ways to earn complexity. You can see the bullet points on the right in those decision rules. And as we go through the samples, I think you'll see, oh, that's what complexity can look like. And there are lots of ways to approach it, but that is the official language of the rubric right there. Awesome. All right, so this is a, this is a sample from LEQ2. And you can see here's the actual handwritten response with the language that's right from the scoring guidelines that are available on AP Central. We do have the handwritten response here, but we think it's really easy to show you the typed response. And so we're gonna go over that with you and you can see and the, you know, look at the colors as we mentioned them. And so we start off here, this is LEQ2. And the prompt was to evaluate the most significant effect of the printing press from the period 1450 to 1650. So this essay starts off exactly like we want you to. It starts off by painting a picture of context. It says prior to the 15th century, literature was only available to the elite upper class. Monks copiously copied classical texts as well as medieval literature, thus preserving the Greek and Roman works that would fuel the Renaissance. Given the scarcity of the written word, the invention of the Gutenberg printing press truly revolutionized society. So this student has given a nice context followed by exactly again the format that we're really hoping that you'll you'll follow and that is a thesis which also has a line of reasoning and the student has, has, has asserted that the most significant effect of the printing press from 1450 to 1650 is arguably the spread of protestant ideals which brought both religious and political upheaval. So the line of reasoning is here at the end. I think the student did a really nice job. And then the students getting into the evidence paragraphs and they're using this T structure that we really like. They start off with a topic sentence before the invention of the printing press, the Bible was almost exclusively limited to the church, which stood as the sole authority of scripture. However, corrupt church practices like the selling of indulgences and pluralism to accumulate wealth caused people to begin questioning their faith in the church. Martin Luther's 95 theses, there's a, an evidence, an example, a reaction to the sale of indulgences hit upon popular discontent. So this student's done a really nice job. They've given a specific example. It's clearly linked back to their argument on the printing press, which I think does a really nice job. All right, you wanna keep going from here, Todd? Sure, here we go. So the, the essay continues. And again, we've just typed up the, the, the samples that you saw in the previous slides. And so it continues. We have more evidence in the structure. Luther's view spread through Europe as the printing press printed his works in vernacular languages. As a result, I really like when you start like that because it's, a, mm -hmm. it's an effect. We're, yep. we're still kind of getting at the, the, the phrasing of the question. As a result of this, his, this spread of ideas, people began to flow, follow Luther's teachings to make education more widely available so that others could read the Bible and to preach in vernacular languages. The spread of Luther's ideals gave rise to other Protestant sects like Calvinism, Anabaptism, and Presbyterians. Calvinist, Anabaptist, and Presbyterian works are also spread with the help of the printing press. And then I I kind of mark this in this pink color because I think they're linking it back to thesis, this in, you know kind of inflaming the Protestant Reformation, Reformation, which without the printing press would have had a significantly lessened impact. So we have a little bit of analysis of why that was important, and then it's linking it back to that thesis. Start the next paragraph. Again, we have a nice topic sentence. The printing press not only capitalized on religious unrest, but also re resulted in political change. Really good. Evidence here, inspired by the works of Martin Luther and disgruntled by manorialism, German peasants revolted and, and this continues on the next slide, which Katie will pick up. Sure, and, and, and I'm gonna piggyback on what you just said, Todd. I, the bar for evidence, and I know I went over the rubric really quickly, but that two, the two points, supporting the argument is really important. And so while I think we set it up really nicely in the topic sentence, when a student does what you just pointed out and brings it back at the end, I think that really strengthens their argument. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go back really quickly. So the German peasants revolted and demanded greater rights on the basis of scripture. The German peasants revolt was one of numerous political uprisings. The Anabaptists, for instance, right? We're giving an example here. Really nice. Uh, captured the city of Munster to build a new Jerusalem, though Catholic and Lutheran forces quickly reclaimed Mun Munster and executed the Anabaptist leaders. 
Meanwhile, the printing press spread news. Again, we're coming right back to linking to the, the prompt and the thesis um, of the Peace of Augsburg, which declared Lutheranism a legally permissible creed. Uh, leaders of the German states within the Holy Roman Empire also read Protestant works. We got a new topic sentence here. Those who adopted Protestantism may have used the religion as a cloak for political dissent, claiming sovereignty over papal and monarchical authority. The 30 years war begun over religious differences wrought devastating death tolls and involved not only the German states, but the Holy Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, but also the countries of Sweden, Denmark, Bohemia and France. So we've got a lot of evidence and examples here. And I do really like what's in pink that it's linked back again to the thesis and the argument. Yeah, really good. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing too, can you go back just a second, Katie? Absolutely. So this, the last piece there in blue, we're telling a lot of information and that's good, but I really like that we talked about in this topic sentence, also read Protestant works as a hint at the, the phrasing of the question, which is about printing press. Yep. So you have to remember not to lose sight of that. Sometimes students get excited and you're throwing down all this evidence like, oh, I know what happened, but we can't lose sight of our argument right. as, we're, as we're putting forward our evidence, okay? Yeah, and um, that's and why it, the topic sentences are so important, right? It's very important. really are, okay. right. So. so it continues, we have a new topic sentence. This is a, a paragraph break, by the way. Widespread communication, which would have increased military advantage, was also brought about by the printing press. Nice. The Peace of Westphalia reestablished peace, declared Calvinism a legally permissible creed, and also ushered in an era of political wars fought over a balance of power. More evidence there, boy. Yep. And then the printing press not only informed Europe of ongoing political and religious issues, but also served as a military asset. So we have a little bit of linking uh, back because we're talking about thesis and a little analysis in that, that bright pink. Next paragraph, nice new topic sentence, and this is going to lead us into that complexity piece. The printing press made the Protestant Reformation possible, and from it, the religious and political changes that ensued. So you remember our first thesis talked about religious and political change. Now we're kind of getting into that. While the Catholic Reformation could serve as a potential qualification, as Catholics also spread their works through the printing press to counter Protestant ideals, it can be argued that by then, the printing press's spread of Protestant works was already so extensive. So you can see this yeah. is going to earn the point for complexity. And again, straight from the scoring commentary that the, the, the readers gave us, because it's going to demonstrate a complex understanding because it provides a nuanced understanding of different ways that print affected the intertwined religious, political, and military history of the period. So that's really nice. And it continues on this next slide. Yep that no degree of papal control could lose the spark that had already been lit. And then in the green, the impact of the printing press is almost incomparable to any other invention except the internet, which also revolutionized communication to conclude the impact of the printing press was profound, most importantly in the Protestant Reformation. So that little bit of green is just like a little bit of context going forward. It kind of says to the readers, Here's why it was, and I, here's what happens kind of in the future that's also similar. So, and you so can you see, see, yeah, go ahead. It's, Katie. it's got full points. It gets the point for thesis, it gets the point for context. It definitely hit that two point bar for supporting the, um, the arguments. And then it gets both points for analysis and reasoning. This is a really nice sample. So, we're hoping that you can have a look at what you did and kind of compare sort of the structure, compare how much evidence, have a look at what you put for your LAQ and see if your evidence is linked back to an argument and think about how you could make what you produce stronger. So as you're practicing these, and there's two other prompts, you can practice full LEQs um, and absolutely have more experience writing these essays. So I think that that's really great. So as we move today to our, our pretty large content piece, we have, we're in unit six, which is industrialization and its effects. And those effects are economic, those effects are definitely ideological, and Todd's going to talk about some of that. But I'm going to really talk about industrialization in Europe, and we're going to start off with context for the Industrial Revolution and the origins of Industrial Revolution in Great Britain. These were changes that occurred really between about 1780 and 1850. Um, definitely in, in B, you can think about what's come before that's really sort of laid the foundation ideologically for all this. 
we've had the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, which has fostered a new worldview. And so we're really thinking about progress and the role of research and experimentation in understanding and in mastering the natural world. So Great Britain is really well suited for this. They have a vibrant scientific and enlightenment culture. This included the British Society of the British Royal Society of Arts and many prizes for innovations in machinery. So we have British industrialists that are going to exploit the latest finding of scientists and technicians from other countries. So by the 18th century, the expanding Atlantic economy and trade with India and China has really served Great Britain remarkably well. They have a vast empire. They have exactly the conditions that are needed for the Industrial Revolution to really thrive there. The mercantilist empire that Britain built is definitely has a strong position for trade in Latin America. It's got the, uh, the slave trade with Africa, raw materials that are really going to be necessary as we start in um, textiles in Great Britain. And we're going to have a really large and growing market for manufactured goods. Um, and all of this is really preceded by the agricultural revolution. So English farmers are continually adopting new methods of farming and their increasing productivity meant lots of crops, uh, lower food prices, but also less need for workers in agriculture. And so those workers are gonna need jobs. And so um, you can see here, the rocket, we'll come back and talk a little bit about that. Todd and I were joking that um, I, so somewhere between 12 and like 15 miles per hour, the, um, kind of a, a funny name that the rocket, but this was a big deal. And we'll come back and talk about uh, locomotion in a minute. So um, European society continued to rely mainly on wood for energy, right? Humans and animals were performing tasks um, in, in, in Great Britain as well as elsewhere. And Great Britain has rich, rich coal supplies. So there they're gonna to start to look at coal as an alternative for the scarce supplies of wood. And a breakthrough is going to uh, definitely occur when industrialists begin to use coal to produce mechanical energy and to power machinery. And we're going to see inventions that come out of this time. And we're gonna see a first starting primitive steam engines that are gonna pump water out of the coal mines. So eventually we will get the very important uh, steam engine. James Watt is going to add a separate condenser that will in increase the efficiency of the steam engine. And this is really, this is the game changer. We are going to see the coal burning steam engine is the industrial revolution's most fundamental advancement in technology. And we're gonna see that piggyback and, and be um, involved in the production of iron. And iron is going to increase from 17,000 tons in 1740 to 3 million tons by the middle of the 19th century. It's going to become cheap and it's going to become the building block of the economy. So all of this is happening really quickly. You can see here this image, this image I love, it's the, the Crystal Palace exhibition um, in 1851. And so Todd's going to talk a little bit about what's going on in Great Britain that's different than what's going on in many other places on the continent during this middle of the 19th century. But Great Britain is showcasing its innovation. It's showcasing its sort of world's fair of all of these incredible, incredible inventions that are, that are being produced. Um, then we're gonna talk a minute about the rocket, right? The first steam locomotive uh, speeding down the, uh, the track and it's going to connect Liverpool and Manchester. And this is gonna be a big deal because this is gonna change how things are transported, how goods are transported, um, how raw materials are transported to factories. And it's gonna reduce the cost and the uncertainty of shipping freight over land. So markets are gonna become larger and even nationwide. These larger markets are gonna encourage larger factories. And we're start to going to see a demand for unskilled labor and we're gonna see this large growth of a class of urban workers. And this is gonna also have an impact on what Todd's gonna to talk about in his ideological piece today. Again, here's our Crystal Palace. Um, it's an industrial fair called the Great Exhibition. Uh, kind of a cool story about uh, this construction that's in Hyde Park where they end up creating this greenhouse-like building so that these large trees in Hyde Park don't have to be cut down. Um, and millions of visitors from all over Europe will travel to Great Britain to see all of the innovation that's going on there at the time. Um, in 1860, Britain, which is the self-proclaimed workshop of the world because of all this innovation, 
produces 20% of the world's output of industrial goods. And this is up from um, just 2% about uh, in 1750. So just a century earlier, we've just completely transformed Great Britain into this amazing industrial powerhouse. And then of course the industry doesn't stay you know, on the island. It does spread uh, to the continent and, and also to the United States. There's strong independent governments in Western Europe who want to mimic Great Britain's industrial success. And sometimes the power of the state promoted industrialization. Many countries will implement taxes on imports, tariff protection in order to support their own economies and industries. Um, but most continental businesses adopted the factory system slowly. In France, the demand for handmade luxury items grew in the 19th century and lacking reserves of iron ore and coal it had fewer and smaller industrial cities, but also less of the social effects that the industrial revolution is going to cause. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, in the German states, the Zollverein or customs union was led by Prussia, this other soon to be powerhouse, and would eliminate tariffs between member states and enact a single tariff to outside nations. And by 19, oh, sorry, 1834, Prussia's rich coal and iron deposits allows it to be the first German state to industrialize. And so, and it is going to continue. It's gonna be a huge powerhouse. We'll have the center of iron production. And by 1850, Prussia was mining over 6 million tons of coal per year to support its railroads and manufacturing. By the mid 19th century, much of Western Europe had industrialized, but there were some areas that lagged. Like for example, in Spain, life is pretty much unchanged. Industry would come slowly. Um, in Russia, there's a continued reliance on serfdom and Russia is going to industrialize later. I kind of tell my students that's sort of a theme that the things in the class are happening later in Russia. Um, it remains mostly agricultural. It will industrialize later and build railroads such, the such as the Trans-Siberian Railroad between uh, Moscow and the Pacific and its coal, iron and steel industries will really start to develop at the turn in, in the 20th century. So there's also a second wave of industrialization that happens later. And so it's going to enter a new phase. There's new sources of power, mechanized industries will be expanded, new industries will appear and will uh, spread geographically. The Bessemer process was introduced to manufacture steel and that's the image that you see there that's on the right. Um, this is something that had been done in China but it hadn't been done in the West. And now this can be done on a mass scale we're gonna see improvements to the steam engine and also the beginning of electricity, another game changer. Um, we will have the invention of the gasoline engine and the diesel engine. And so of course the second wave of industrialization includes automobiles, airplanes, and new methods of shipping before 1914, which is of course the start of World War I. Um, we have new communications that are really gonna make the world so much smaller and telegraphs are a really important part of that. The transatlantic telegraph cable will make communication between North America and Europe possible, and oil will become a coveted natural resource, as well as um, new chemical industries, which will emerge. And so, of course, and we're going to see the impact of that. We'll talk a little bit about that this week when we talk about World War I. Um, industrial research labor laboratories will replace kind of small individual inventors. So we really do see this, this massive wave of industrialization that takes place starting in Great Britain and really takes over. But of course, this industrialization has consequences. And you can see in the, the image here that's on the right side of the screen, um, you, can, you can see the family, it says, Miss Kennedy distributing clothing at Kilrush. And um, we have a lot of negative social effects because of industrialization. Um, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the working conditions are deplorable for workers. Uh, there will be some attempts to address that that Todd will talk about, but initially they're really terrible. People are working long hours, often up to 18 hours a day, and in conditions where there's very poor light and ventilation. I like telling my students to stop complaining about their school day when, uh, when we talk about how long the, the factory workers are, are toiling there. Um, women and children at this time are actually preferred. They have smaller hands that could reach into the machinery and women and children frequently um, worked for significantly lower wages, sometimes a quarter or a half of what a man would make at the job. Um, some children develop permanent spine deformation from having to walk stooped over. 
explosions or cave-ins in mines were like an ever-present fear and a reality. Laborers become sick. They develop breathing and lung disease from exposure to toxic substances, and they're often injured, mutilated, killed by machinery. Women's hair would get caught up in the machines. It was There was a lot of injuries that happened um, due to, to unsafe working conditions, and there was no regulation for this at all. Um, in their homes, conditions for workers were not much better. As those out of work um, farmers and farm workers crowded into these industrial cities, the cities become incredibly overcrowded. Housing and sewage disposal cannot keep up with population growth. There's diseases such as dysentery and cholera, uh, air and water pollution, and a drastically reduced life expectancy. There are social problems too. Um, alcoholism reaches epidemic proportions in England. There's prostitution, there's crime and sanitation problems that really defines urban life. So the social effects of industrialization are very negative. Um, there, are some, there are some positive effects from industrialization, particularly if you were part of the middle class. Um, there was a growing middle class that was able to buy homes and they could purchase luxury items, which are available now. Things like china, furniture, art, all of that comes out as a positive sort of for a very small percentage of the people of industrialization. All right, so Todd, I think you're up with a lot of things ideological that are affected by this growing industry. Great, thank you, Katie. Did a nice job of going through that. It's a lot of content lot of to content. unpack. So we're gonna go into the ideology of change. And so we look at the course and exam description, explain how and why different intellectual developments challenged the political and social order from 1815 to 1914. So what this really is getting into is we think about our opening where we talked about you know, the two streams, these two revolutions that are going on, and you can go to the next slide, Katie, where we have this economic revolution, and then we also have this political revolution at the same time. What's going to happen when we have all this economy going and surging like it is, and then political aspects trying to also keep up with pace, it's going to result in some type of social reform or a crossing of these streams. So what kind of liberal reforms are occurring in Great Britain? 18th century Great Britain had been very stable, but liberalism will shift from laissez-faire economic policies to responses to these different challenges of industrialization. So you see the scoop, excuse me, the soup kitchen image, and you have all these people coming into the, in these cities, as Katie talked about, uh, but the cities are not prepared to handle the mass group of people who all want jobs, who all need food, who all need housing. By 1832 in Great Britain, they're gonna pass an important act called the Reform Act of 1832. It extends suffrage to twice as many males as before suffrage, meaning the vote, but, but continued to require property ownership for voting. So it also gave industrial cities representation for the first time. So think about that. Big cities that were growing like Manchester and Liverpool didn't really have any representation in parliament at a time when they really needed voice in parliament to enact these changes that are being affected uh, because of this tremendous economic growth. The British Empire is gonna abolish slavery in 1833. And the Factory Act is also passed, bans children from under nine from working and limit the hours of older children. But still, my gosh, no. I mean, the 10 year old, you know, working in the factory kind of seems just a little bizarre, but um, they really felt that they were really reforming at that time. The poor laws were passed 1934. These were laws that punished the poor uh, by making relief in government workhouses more unpleasant than actual employment. So there were the intention was to get you out of the poorhouse, get you working in the employ uh, in, in the workforce. But that wasn't as easy as it as it seemed because sometimes there were more people than there were jobs available. Um, in point E, there's something called the Anti Corn Law League. Um, these might feel a little disjointed, but they are connected. Trust me was founded in 1939 It argued that it's necessary to repeal the corn laws to, to lower the food price. So what happened with the corn laws is Britain had passed these laws that said none of the grain that can be imported cheaply from outside of Great Britain can be bought until all of our grain is bought. And what was really happening is you had the wealthy landowning agriculturalists in the House of Lords, basically protecting their own and not really allowing the market to determine the price 
of goods because they weren't allowing cheaper corn to come on. So those who pay the price are going to be those the, the the poorest, and so they we, the market is not demanding it. It's a little ironic or hypo, hypocritical because though on one hand they'll argue for less safe air economics or invisible hand, on the other hand they will go and enact laws that give them the benefit first. The laws are going to be repealed in 1946 after the Irish potato famine, then allow free import of much less expensive, much less expensive foreign grain. So that comes into the market, lowering cost. The Mines Act banned women and children from the mines. The 10 Hours Act, 1847, limited the workday for women and young people in factories. So think about all these political changes trying to deal with all this great economic change that is resulting in tremendous social change. There's our, our mixing or a crossing of the streams. Okay, so take a look at this image, Dudley Street from London, a pilgrimage, 1872. And this is kind of that, what, what things look like. You have all these people in this very tight area and you see they have shoes and socks and things laid out. They're trying to keep clean. Um, it, it just, it looks, it's a depressing scene as you can see. Reforms transformed rather unhealthy and overcrowded cities. They try to modernize the infrastructure and we bring about this new public health movement. Uh, it's gonna reform prisons, establish a modern police force. Um, they were enacted by governments, motivated by such forces as public opinion, prominent individuals, charity organizations are all moving toward this public health thing. Uh, point B, social reformers address the need for additional housing. Um, we have so many people packed into the housing, they want more housing available and increased regulation raise the minimum standards, as well as encourage municipal and private charitable efforts. Sewers and treatment plants will dump waste into local rivers, lakes, and seas. So we think that that's better at the time because before the waste was about basically in the streets, uh, but it's still an environmental disaster. And in point D, a breakthrough in understanding how bad drinking water and filth made people sick, right? So one of the breakthroughs comes from Frenchman Louis Pasteur, he develops this idea of germ theory of disease. Uh, and it's brought about great improvements in hospitals, operating rooms, as not only wounds, but equipment and hands and clothing become sterilized. So if you think about, you pour your milk on your breakfast cereal uh, in the morning, and that milk is likely pasteurized, right? It's been heated to get rid of organisms in the milk. Um, e, more effective urban planning, improve the quality of life by designing new streets with open spaces and parks. So they're trying to make cities better, more habitable, and they understand that we need space and clean everything to make that happen. Then F, the development of mass public transportation, enhanced living conditions. Because if we don't have to be right next to the factory and all these people packed in, if they can be further out and spread out, but we have a transportation system that will bring them into work that will make things better. So we have streetcars that begin to run on electricity. Okay. So we have these changes kind of going urban and now we have these, we're gonna go kind of broader out with these ideologies of change. And we're now we're looking at socialist call for the risk redistribution of society's resources and wealth. And it'll evolve from a utopian idea to a Marxist scientific critique of capitalism. So we're gonna go into this idea of um, modern socialism as we would call it, okay? Early socialist thinkers believe that political revolution in France, industrialization in Britain, the rise of laissez-faire is gonna create selfish individualism. And all that does is create splits in the community into these isolated fragments. And so this is kind of this, there are people that want to help the poor, and they think that the only way that that can truly happen is if we create some type of economic equality. So socialists are preaching economic equality. They want economic planning by the government. They want regulation of private property uh, by the government, or they want it abolished completely and have thing every com communal, every community ownership. So this segment's kind of like, do you know your French utopian socialists? First, Count Henri de Saint-Simon. He proclaims that the key to progress is proper social organization. Some of this comes from this idea of the scientific revolution and this idea of enlightenment and that can we take a scientific, can we take a community problem, a social problem, apply science and then construct better communities. So leading scientists, engineers, industrialists want to plan everything, plan the economy, guide it forward, 
by undertaking vast public work projects is one of the ways. The next French utopian socialist, Charles Fourier, envisioned a socialist utopia, mathematically precise, self-sufficient communities, advocates the total emancipation of women. We're gonna have everyone equal and everyone doing their part. So let's start with this image here. Uh, Mr. Owen, uh, Robert Owen has, is, is also a socialist uh, and he wants this ideas, these very planned communities. This is quadrille dancing. Um, and you know, we would call it square dancing, quadrille dancing, but we have all, it's all precise and it's supposed to kind of represent this idea of modern socialism. So Robert Owen, an early proponent of labor unions, also wants the society to be organized into these model industrial agricultural communities. So you have Saint-Simon, you have Foyer, Owen, who become known as your utopian socialists. Each had followers who try to implement their ideas. Their attempts collapsed by about the 1950s, but they inspire future reformers and revolutionaries, which we're going to talk about. So in 1840, a significant work is What is Property by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. He's going to argue that property is the profit stolen from the worker who was the source of wealth. Gosh, you really need to have that down because it really leads to next wage thinking as we get into Marx. If you believe that what's happening profit for the capitalists is actually something that had been stolen from a worker, that leads into this, this more of this idea of socialism. Louis Blanc will focus on practical reforms and organization of work. He wants workers to agitate for universal voting rights and take the control of the state peacefully. So Blanc is saying we have a system where we can advocate for what we want, we should be using that system and let's not get ahead of ourselves. We should, you should, you should, you know, unionize and you'll be able to do that. And then point E, as industrialism spread, the socialist message is embraced by French urban workers who are becoming really opposed to laissez-faire laws. They're opposed to these things that deny workers the right to organize in guilds and unions. Um, and it's really important you to understand that. And then the aspiration of workers, and radical theorists reinforce each other and give rise to the socialist movement in Paris in the 30s and 40s. So here you go, you've got political change being pushed along with great economic change. We're starting to cross the streams and you're starting to see socialism emerge. And then it, we come into the advent of Karl Marx. He's gonna weave these diffuse strands of socialist thought. So we had all our French utopian socialists and Robert Owen and Proudhon and, uh, and Blanc and he's going to try and come up with one kind of theory, distinctly modern ideology, which will be called Marxist socialism or simply Marxism. He will study philosophy in Berlin before turning to journalism. And then he's forced to flee Prussia in 1843. He's going to travel to Europe to promote, throughout Europe to promote socialism and rely on his friend and colleague Engels for his financial support because he doesn't have a job. He is a, a thinker. Uh, after the revolutions of 1848 throughout Europe, Marx will settle in London. One thing I want you to remember when you study the revolutions of 1848, those were really contained to the continent and not so much in Great Britain. So Marx settles in London. He's going to spend the rest of his life there advocating for working class revolution. And he'll write Das Kapital, which appear, is published in 1867. In the D, D uh, paragraph, he'll synthesize then. He's going to bring together sociology, economics, philosophy, and history. And he's going to draw on the ideas of those utopian socialists. He's going to criticize them for their fanciful utopian schemes and says, we need a, his version is a scientific socialism and it's rooted in historic law. You have to understand history if you understand um, oppressed peoples and what they can do about it. So he builds on these philosophies of idealism associated with he Hegel. Marx will come to believe that history has patterns and purpose and move forward in stages toward a goal. It's really important that part to get at his final kind of magnum opus, if you will. So we have this image on the right. It's the Associated Shipwrights Society. So if you became, if you worked for the shipwrights and you became a member of the Shipwrights Society, like a union, you would get the certificate to certify you remember. So I talked to you about Marx and how he's looking at history and he will argue class struggle over economic wealth produced change in human history. One class has always throughout history said exploited the other. And with the advent of modern industry, society is now split between upper class, the bourgeoisie 
and the working class, which he will call the proletariat. He'll further argue that the ever-growing, ever-poorer proletariat will develop revolutionary class consciousness. And he predicts it's going to lead them to overthrow the bourgeoisie in a violent revolution. He says, this is what will happen. It will just, they'll be fed up at some point and they will, it will be a bloody violent revolution. He will posit or say, or put forward the idea that surplus value, the difference between the value of goods and the wages of workers received to produce them, the bourgeoisie is pocketing it in the form of profit. He says it actually belongs to the worker. Point D, Marx, to Marx, capitalism is productive, but it's exploitative. As the bourgeoisie in a never ending effort for profit squeeze workers dry, and it's gonna expand across the globe, he says it must be stop stopped. Marx and Engel publish their kind of magnum opus, which is the Communist Manifesto, 1848. At that time, the communist movement was in its infancy, but by the time of Marx's death in 1883, Marxism has profoundly reshaped really left-wing radicalism. So the other thing you have to understand about that as we get into the next part is that there are more and more workers, right? Industrialism is growing, so more and more workers, and so his ideas are also growing. Okay, here we go into the practice about MCQs. Here we are, we're gonna unpack the multiple choice question and we have a strategy for you. First, when you get the multiple choice question, you know it's gonna be typically it's a passage or it's an image. So closely read the source line of the image or the passage first. Now, when we say read the source line, it's at the bottom. So your eyes are gonna to wanna to go and start reading the passage, but please read the source because it gives you context about for what you're about to read. Then read the passage carefully, annotate it if you want. What is the, the question asking you? And then use your reasoning to eliminate false ant responses. It can't be this because of this. Select your best reason to answer. That's the way you approach the multiple choice. Good, and, and, and you know, as we're looking at an example, Todd, you know, a lot of times these passages look like what students have already seen and what we're gonna talk about later this week on the DBQ, but the DBQ has the source at the beginning, and we need to really remember that in the multiple choice, we're gonna see the source at the end. So we're here looking at um, Navarro, who is a Spanish theologian, the Manual of Confessors and Penit Penitents in Spain, 1556. So this is where you really should be thinking about who this person is, where he is, what, what's going on during the time period, and really start to try in your head to contextualize what you're about to read, because that's going to help you with the questions, which Todd will go through with you in a minute. So I'll read through this passage with you, and then Todd can go through the questions. As to that which causes money to rise or fall in value, namely whether it is scarce and greatly needed or abundant, money is worth more when and where it is scarce than where it is abundant. The reasons for this opinion are as follows. First, that this concept is common to all men, good and evil, throughout Christendom, and thus it would seem to be a law of God and nature. Second, and of great importance, that all merchandise becomes dear when it is in great demand and short supply, and that money, insofar as it may be sold, bartered, or exchanged by some other form of contract, is merchandise, and therefore also becomes dear, dearer when it is in great demand and short supply. And then third, that other things being equal in countries where there is a great scarcity of money, all other saleable goods, and even the hands of labor and men are given for less money than where it is abundant. Thus, we see by experience that in France, where money is scarcer than in Spain, bread, wine, cloth, and labor are worth much less. And even in Spain, in times when money was scarcer, saleable goods and labor were given for very much less than after the discovery of the Indies, which flooded the country with gold and silver. The reason for this is that money is worth more where and when it is scarce than where and when it is abundant. All right, so they've, we've, we've repeated the same kind of idea several times in this passage. All right, Todd, so take us through the questions. Okay, so if you want to pause the video here, you can, because I'm not going to read this through, but we'll give you, we'll pause the video and then we'll show you what the answer is. But I want the question basically, which of the following evidence does Asboqueta give in his second point for money changing in value. So you'd have to refer back to the passage. You can pause the video now. And there is your answer. And we'll go into question two. Which of the following evidence regarded, regarding Spain does Azblaqueta use to support his argument? Pause the video here and read your responses. 
and you see B is the correct answer. These were taken from AP Classroom. And okay. Go ahead. So, so we have a multiple choice set for you to practice with for homework. Um, you can access it either with the QR code on your phone or you can type in the tiny URL that's there. And then we'll go over the answers and actually explain the reasoning behind the right answers. But this will be a very typical, I know that sometimes teachers don't have you practicing all year these stimulus-based multiple choice questions. And that is what you're gonna see on the AP test really soon. So I think it's important for you to get as much practice in on them as you can. So that's what your homework is for tonight and tomorrow we'll go over the answers um, together. All right, Todd, do you have anything to add? You wanna tell us nope. about the do rest your of practice our and then we'll talk about our learning here. This is what we did today. Oh my gosh, there was a lot of content, Katie. Industrial revolution <laughs> and ideology to change to try and squeeze in as best we could. You have your homework as the MCQ set. Hey, session six, nationalism, new imperialism. We're still in that long 19th century, but you need to tune in because we're gonna go through a sourcing exercise with you. And that is one of the key elements of doing the DBQ well. Speaking of DBQ, session seven, we got the DBQ. We wanna tune in for session seven because we're gonna structure the DBQ for you. And then session eight, a lot of exam and reminders for you. Absolutely. And the DBQ is 25% of the points on the exam. So I think it's really important that you practice it and you feel really comfortable with it. So, so this is going to be an important day. All right. Well, thank hey, Katie, you, everyone. Did, uh -oh. Yes, thank you, everybody. Here Katie, did I ever tell you that I once had a turtle as a teacher? No, you've never told me you once had a turtle yeah, as a teacher. Yeah, he taught us well. Oh. He taught us. I think the teacher he taught us well are getting worse and worse. <laughs> I really think they're getting worse and worse. All right, everyone. Thank you. We'll, we'll be back to go over that homework and more content tomorrow. Take care. Thanks, everybody.